My mom has started a crazy but fun tradition years ago as our kids were getting older and uh, my brother and I uh, are obviously grown, though maybe it's not obvious all the time. Um, we, uh, my mom wanted to keep Christmas fun and keep that, that childlike spirit. So she has this tradition and what she does is she gets the granddaughters and they go throughout the house the day that we're there, uh, the morning that we're there, and they just start collecting props and costumes and it's just clothes, stuff they find in the closet, in the attic, just junk they find in the kitchen and closets and whatever. And they put it in these like plastic grocery bags. And they, they're, they're, what they're doing is they're building costume bags for a skit, a Christmas play that all of us are required to participate in. There's no audience. We're just it. That's all of us. We're just hanging out Christmas morning. And we, we all know the script. We all know the play because the text of the script is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. It's like the Christmas story, and you got uh, Joseph and Mary riding into Bethlehem. you got shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. If you've seen the Charlie Brown Christmas special, you know the story. Like, so it's the Jesus story. He's being born. And, but what we don't know is what role we're going to play from year to year. And so there's a moment where we're just like, okay, here it goes. So all these bags kind of get gathered together. And then this randomly, we're, we're selected to have bags. And whatever bag you have has your costume in it. Therefore, your role. You'll know what you're going to get. Okay. And so this can, like, before you get like, dang, man, the Woolards are super spiritual, man. They do like nativity plays at their house. This is anything but solemn. Okay. It's like complete chaos. And so, like, for example, a couple of years ago, one character is the star. I mean, this is the costume for the star, by the way. Um, the Dallas Cowboys star, because that's the real star. And so anyway, the star of Bethlehem uh, is like, uh, it, it, that, that's the narrator. So the star reads the story. And then everyone else just pan, pantomimes the story as the star reads it. And so then whatever you get. So like one year, uh, I got to be Joseph. Uh, super manly role, right? Good, good guy, Joseph. Got to wear my dad's bathrobe. I think it was still a little bit like damp maybe from the last time he used it. That was, that was weird. And, uh, but the girls just put it in the bag, so I had to put it on. And so like I'm, I'm Joseph and I'm ready. Uh, my, my mom was the donkey. And so that's cool, matriarch, you know, give a good qualified role, donkey. Uh, but that's what she got. Um, and then this one was fun. Uh, my dad was the Mother Mary. And so if you've never seen a 63-year-old man with a beard wearing like a, a blue, like, I don't know, shawl thing on his head and like stuff to pillow up his shirt to be the baby Jesus, have you ever done Christmas? Like this is how it should be. And if you don't know my dad, the dude's a trip. Okay, he's an absolute trip. We compare him a lot to Steve Martin, the old you know, comedian and stand-up guy. Like he, he's like, to me, it's like that guy. But like imagine if Steve Martin had a beard and now he's playing the part of a little girl in a Christmas play. This is my dad. Okay, so this is the play, all right? And it, the rest of it plays out. But can I remind you what my mom's job was? My mom was the donkey. So what's the donkey's job in the Christmas play? Mary rides on the donkey, okay? So dad, I'll let you use your imagination to figure out how that went. It was a trip. We do have it on video, and it's available for a price. Um, a good time. Okay, that's a dumb story, right? Like, we all have these things we do. And it's fun. Uh, we're in this uh, series that we've been calling Twas the Night Before, an Advent story. And so what we've been doing for the, last, for the rest of this month, you know, last few weeks, has been just going through the stories in the Bible that lead up to the coming of Jesus. Advent is a, a word that kind of means arrival. And so it's the anticipation of the arrival of Jesus. And it's kind of a traditional thing. A lot of people in churches, Christians for years have done it. And the way it works is kind of you take a, a word each week, and it's your focus word. And the way we've done it, it's a word and a story. So we've broken down a story, we've looked at the word, and we see how that's relevant to us today. And it's been a lot of fun. This week, our Advent word is joy. Joy. We sang earlier the song, Joy to the World. Probably one of the best-known Christmas songs there is. You know the lyrics. It plays in the back of your mind at the Christmas time. Joy. Joy is a, is a feeling we experience. We have some amazing babies at our church. And like, I can't help but just look. There's one right there. I just look at them and I'm just like, their little bald heads and, and, and their little toes are the best. And like, they just make you all warm and cuddly inside and they can bring you joy. And so I think it's fitting that like joy is a very big Christmas word. It is about a baby and all this stuff. There's obviously more to the God story that's going on there. But what I want to do today is explore one of most God's, God's most important truths, joy, by diving into that same story that my, my family interacts with and uh, reenacts at Christmas every year. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and open it up. You can look on your phone. we got Bibles in the lobby if you need one to have. They're yours. Take it or borrow it for the service, whatever. Um, or just follow along on the screen. 
And we're in Luke chapter 2. Luke's one of the biographies of the life of Jesus. And in this one, I love Luke because Luke is a historian. And he's almost like an investigative journalist. You can guarantee, because this is something he says in the very beginning of, his, uh, of one of his books, that you know, I, I went out and I investigated these things. And so you will see Luke always sprinkling in specific details like a good journalist. He's going to have uh, dates and locations. And he mentions here a couple of uh, political leaders. So we can put that on the calendar, you know, put it on the, the timeline. And let's just dive into this story. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1. It says, In those days... Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So right here you see a couple of those details. I mean, he's talking about Caesar Augustus. That's a big swath of Roman history. Uh, and he specifically points out this time period when this guy, Quirinius, was governor of Syria. And so there's this census, much like we have in America every 10 years. We just had one in 2020. And uh, people would go to kind of their hometown or the ancestral home of their family line and they would register for the census. Verse 3, it says, everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. Those are all things you can track on, track on a map. Uh, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. That's something we talked about some last week. This is a, a very important ancestral line. David was a king. Joseph was like great, 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 great grandson to King David. Um, and he went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And so maybe you've heard this story a million times, but let's just remind ourselves of some details. We, we already met Mary last week. We spent a good deal of time talking about her. She's a young lady. She's probably anywhere from 13 to 15 years old, and she was engaged legally to, uh, to this guy Joseph, but they hadn't consummated that marriage yet, and it was this miraculous thing where an angel appeared and said, you're going to you're going to be pregnant. You're going to have a baby. It's going to be the son of God. They've been wrestling with that. You meet Joseph in this story. We haven't talked much about him. Now, Joseph is traditionally called like a carpenter. We heard that. Uh, but more recent research scholarship, like it's actually not all that recent. It's just we like the idea of him being a carpenter. Uh, but more likely, he was probably like a, uh, a mason, like a stone mason. And if you look at just what was going on in this region, there were lots of day laborers who would go to quarries. They would, I mean, you see what's still standing from the Roman Empire today, right? A lot of these guys built that. And so, he, the word is just called like a like laborer or worker uh, that describes him. But that's, that's, uh, that's Joseph's story. And when Mary comes to Joseph and is like, listen, bud, uh, I know we're engaged. I'm pregnant, and God told me it was a miracle. And I'm thinking, he didn't even hear the miracle part or angel part. She was trying to explain to him, right? And this is the thing. And he's like, what? What do you mean? You're pregnant like you've been unfaithful to me. So he is quietly arranged to be divorced from her. But then God sends an angel to Joseph. And he's like, listen, dude. It's legit. Uh, if you didn't notice, I'm an angel now to also, and this is true. And so Joseph, by this point in the story, Luke chapter 2, has bought into the story. Okay, so that, that catches us up on, on Joseph. Um, he agrees to play this role. And, and eventually, um, they get to the point where they go in to take this census. Now, there's just two things I want to point out because it's key and vital to understanding how God works. I mean, throughout Scripture. It's some of God's most important and vital moments in his history line. He allows some of the most normal, everyday, like you would never suspect people to play the roles. You've got this little girl from the middle of nowhere who had no reason to be on the world stage, Mary. You've got this blue-collar laborer, Joseph. And what's about to happen, they're at the center of God's plan for redemption for the whole world. That's just God's way. He's constantly showing up, and it's just a continual reminder to us, like, Look, you're not rich, you're not powerful, you're not famous. Cool. God will use you. It's his way. He specializes in using normal and even broken people all the time. Uh, okay, verse 6. The time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths. She placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there are a million books and movies that depict this. And whatever your favorite one is, I want you to picture it right now. Because it's, it's a good thing. But again, this is not how I would have told this story. This dude, this girl, they're nobodies. And then how do we bring God into the world? Can I remind us what's happening here? If you look at Philippians chapter 2, if you wanted to look at that later this week, it would be a great chapter to read the week before Christmas. But what it says is that God emptied himself and took the form of a human being. And then he became obedient to the form of a human being. So we know from the stories of Jesus' life, he, he was hungry, he was tired, he got frustrated, he had to deal with 
people. That's difficult, right? And this is Jesus. And, and how did he enter the scene? As a baby born to these nobodies who couldn't even get a good room for her mom. A lot of you people have had babies in this room. Some of your babies are sitting in this room. And most of you had some sort of plan going in, right? That was like a professional <laughs> who helped you. Very rarely does it like happen, you know, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out or at least have some good plans. And this is not how any of us would tell the story of how God enters the scene, but this is how God chooses for it to go. Again, underlying how God really wants to say, I am, I'm here to show you that I understand your plight. And I don't know about you, but this next part we're about to read in verse 8. Every time I hear like verse 8 through, I don't know, 13 or 14, I always hear it in the voice of Linus from the Charlie Brown special. There's this moment where Charlie Brown's real frustrated, so this is like for us old people, some of you young guys, it's on Apple, uh, the Apple TV, and it's on there right now, so you, you can it's, you just pay $10 a month, rent it just for December, watch the Christmas special from Charlie Brown, um, but you know, there's this moment, Charlie Brown's frustrated, they have to go out and get a Christmas tree, Chris, Charlie Brown gets this like lousy Christmas tree, it's falling apart, and everybody's like, you're such a blockhead, Charlie Brown, and he's like, ah, and then he says to his friend, is there anyone who can tell me what Christmas is all about, and then Linus, with his little blue blanket, I can tell you what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. And he steps out onto the stage that miraculously appears, and he goes, lights, please. And the lights come in. Y'all seen it. And then he basically quotes this. There were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Because today in the town of David, there is a Savior that has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. God used this crazy scenario of the manger this is the trough that like a sheep or a cow would eat out of. To be a sign for these guys because whose baby's going to be wrapped and laying in a manger? That must be the one. And then Linus continues. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel. Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. If you were going to make the most important announcement that ever was announced, who would you tell? There were a lot of more important people in this region that these angels should have shown up to tell. I mean, the high priest Caiaphas was down in Jerusalem. He was pretty important. Like, why didn't the angels be like, yo, Caiaphas, hey, you guys know scripture really well. Check it out. The Messiah's up in Bethlehem. He'll be in a manger because that's where God decided to put it. Could have gone to Caiaphas. You might have gone to like a religious leader. There's this guy named Nicodemus who is in his prime right now. And you're going to read about him later uh, as the disciples come along in about 30 years. I mean, this guy Nicodemus is coming up. Maybe one of his leaders, a guy named Gamaliel. Some, some one of these great leaders, like a Pharisee, who people trust. And these people studied the scriptures. And they would have known the stories from like Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel. And they've been like putting the things together. And all of a sudden being like, ah. And an angel shows up to them and says, listen. The baby has been born. It's the Messiah, the king. Go and worship him. Maybe you didn't know any famous people. You would at least get like the town square or like a really popular Facebook page or at least put it like somewhere where someone who matters could see it. But God doesn't do any of that. He shows up his most powerful choir of angels, by the way, which is magnificent. I can't imagine what that must have looked like. Or sounded like. We're not talking about one angel. Normally when one angel shows up, the character in the Bible pees their pants. And they're terrified. This is a choir. And they are not out of tune. If you've ever felt the bass at a good concert. I mean, just multiply it. To who? These dudes are sitting around the fire burning a stick. You got to take it slow because you don't have that many sticks to burn when you poke the fire. You know what I mean? You put it out. Stir the wood. You know, I don't know. Jebediah just told the story about, <laughs> oh, the sheep today, they were just, this one sheep was like just eating grass, and uh, 
Oh, then he laid down, took a nap, and the other shepherds are like, that's a good one. You know, like there's nothing going on. They're in the field. Boom! Angels show up. Like, also culturally, the shepherds were nobodies. It was one of the top three or four professions, but it was the one you didn't want your kids to grow up to do. Like, you could pull it off. You could, you could pull it off. It would make a living. But, like, shepherds in a lot of settings, in a lot of towns, like, they weren't trusted because they were outsiders. In fact, if there was, like, a legal court case, uh, sometimes if a shepherd had the testimony, they'd be like, I don't know if we can accept this as a testimony. Like, that's the status of shepherd. And our God, in his infinite, just bizarre things he does to just show us that he's here to make the world different, makes this announcement to these dudes in the field. It's not how I would have imagined it going. It's not how you would have written the story. You would have failed this writing exam because your teacher was like, this isn't plausible. But in verse 11, he's, they're told, today in the town of David, a Savior's been born. He's the Messiah. You're going to find him wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Verse 15, it says, and when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, uh, let's go to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and guess what they found? Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. What a story, man. What a story. Like, you've heard it, right? Charlie Brown told it. You've seen it on every Christmas special. But this isn't just a fairy tale book that you flip through. Like, this is how God entered the scene. And that's the story from Luke chapter 2. And here we are over 2,000 years later, and we're still talking about it. And it's not that we're just still talking about it. I don't do a lot of raise your hand moments in the church, but has Jesus changed anybody's life in this room? Oh, my goodness. And we are a small sampling of the billions of people whose lives have been utterly changed, transformed is the word the Bible uses, by this bizarre, unexpected moment. Jesus didn't come to save the perfect and put together because they don't need a savior and they also don't exist. Our God is the God of the misfit. The brokenhearted, the shamed, the disenfranchised, the sinful, the marginalized. And through his story, the way he entered the scene, he says, I'm the God. I'm the God who's going to take the willingness of a teenage girl and the acceptance of a blue-collar mason, and I'm going to make the world a different place. I'm going to be the God who will take your pain and turn it into joy, who's going to take your mourning and turn it into gladness. The world's broken, but I'm the God that wants to partner with you to put it back together. That's that's the story we celebrate at Christmas, the goodness of our God who come and inserts himself to the story. And the shepherds leave. They see this baby, and I I skipped it earlier, but now I want to say it. This is verse 20. They love this verse, verse 20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen, which are just as they had been told. This is a side thing for those of us who are skeptics, because it's really cool that God very intentionally lines up the details to make sure that it makes sense to the audience. The shepherds found exactly what they expected to find. They weren't just blown away by some sort of lights and mirrors show, but it was just like God told them it would be. So we say joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven heaven and nature sing. So, here's a question I kind of want to explore as we draw to the end. Did this baby really bring joy to the world? I mean, because I don't know about you, but the world is a broken, messed up place. Anybody got baggage and background and faults and failures? Anybody have a broken family and some deadbeat dad or mom or friend who hurt you? 
it's hard for us to swallow sometimes that God has joy for the world because sometimes we wake up and go, I just don't feel the joy. Statistically, our culture has the most anxiety and depression of all times. Did this baby bring joy to the world? I think it really comes when we look at the difference between joy and what its, its cousin, happiness. I've talked about joy several times here, and so this might be repeat for you, but it's, it's good stuff. Now, happiness and joy, if you look in the dictionary, linguistically, they're like the same word, okay? The definition for happiness is almost the same definition as joy. I mean, it's not... But spiritually, especially as it's seen in Scripture, uh, there is a difference. And so happiness is this. Happiness is what uh, the Apostle Paul calls walking in the flesh. This is my flesh and blood. So as long as my flesh is, is, has good feelings, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy when things are working out. I'm happy when things are going the way that I want to. When I have the, my best snacks and the temperature's right and nobody's messing with me, I'm happy. I'm happy when the Dallas Cowboys are just crushing it right now. I'm happy, right? I'm happy because my flesh is satisfied. I've got that happiness. But here's the thing that I've learned. Happiness is slippery. It's, it's like trying to hold onto a bar of soap. It's just slippery because as soon as you have the happiness, whoo, you're the Philadelphia Eagles and you're crushing it and you're winning the NFL. And then the Dallas Cowboys show up on Sunday night and beat you 33 to 13. I'm sorry, Jalen. I know it hurts. The kicker scored more points than the rest of the Eagles. It's a deep cut. Look, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. I know happiness is slippery. <laughs> I'm prepared for tonight. But look, I, yeah, I, I joke, but happiness is slippery, right? I mean, you had the girlfriend, and then she turned out to be not the one. And you had the job, but, man, they just had layoffs, and you were actually killing it. You didn't do anything wrong. Happiness is slippery, and so when our flesh loses the feeling of happiness... We slip into anxiety and depression. The brokenness of this world is not God's causation or his lack of action. It's because we try to fuel ourselves on happiness. And it is an empty fuel. It doesn't have the power to fuel us. Joy, as opposed to walking in the flesh, is what it means to walk in the spirit. When God's spirit is moving in us, and this is a, a, like a working definition I've been playing with with joy for a little while, but joy comes from something else. If happiness is from making me feel good, joy is finding pleasure in honoring God and putting other people first. That's actually the greatest commandment, Jesus says. If we can love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we can love others as ourselves, and there's love your neighbor, serve other people, like there's all kinds of ways to say that. And we, and we know this is true. We know this is true because that's why we say things at Christmas like, it is better to give than to receive. Because like, even if you don't get anything, if you're able to get the joy of someone else receiving something, you're like, man, I'm glad I was able to do that for them. Even if I don't have all the things that I need to give. It's why when you pull over and you help someone who's broken down the side of the road, or you help someone who's having a hard day, like you do that, like it might make you late for your meeting. You might get in trouble somewhere else, but you walk away going, that was the right thing to do. Because it honored God and it put other people first. When you give someone an extra few dollars when you know they really need it. And maybe you don't get to get the sandwich you were going to get at lunch. Because that was your lunch money. But they needed it. You didn't need it. You're not going to starve. You'll eat at supper. You'll get the cheaper thing. And it brings you joy because you put others first. And God built that into us. That's called walking in the spirit. And what's interesting is even someone who doesn't believe in Jesus can experience this. Because that's, we're created in the image of God. Even if we don't honor him with our lives, our soul, our makeup is built from his stuff. And so we experience things the way he experiences them many times in character and in different ways. And so that's why scripture says, it calls it like tasting that the Lord is good. That little moment where you're like, oh man, and you see them smiling and walking away and you gave them your extra five bucks and you're like, <laughs> hmm. And you just experience in the joy of the Lord. That's it. That little moment. Just a moment. But don't you love that moment? That's joy. No teaching on joy would be complete without looking at how Jesus exemplified this. Honoring God and putting other people first. 
And there's a lot of places. I talked about Philippians chapter 2 already. You can jot that down, read it later. But one of my favorite places in Hebrews chapter 12. I think we looked at that last week, Hebrews 11. And Hebrews chapter 12, after this whole like kind of dissertation on God's plan from the Old Testament to the New Testament and what Jesus' role is, when we get into chapter 12, it finally like lands the plane on why Jesus is so important to God's narrative. It says in verse 1, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 is what I'm going to read. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. He went first. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It's better to give than to receive. He scorned its shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Ah. <sighs> I grow weary and lose heart a lot. (laughs) What this passage teaches is that the way we overcome that and we find joy is we actually consider the one who was the pioneer of it. Jesus gave up heaven. He humbled himself to become human. Just in case you missed this, this is in John chapter 1, verse 14. But like at the Christmas story, we talk about Jesus coming as a baby. In the gospel of John, when he talks about Jesus coming uh, to the world, he uses more um, poetic terms. And Jesus has a nickname called the Word of God. And there's a whole lot of really cool stuff behind that we want to give into. But this is, what, this is how he describes Jesus as coming into the world. He says, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. One translation says he set up camp with us. One says Jesus moved into the neighborhood. This is God becoming human. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And that's the Jesus story, and that's what this baby's all about. But it's not just this baby in the manger. The dude then grows up. And he learns how to walk and how to read. And he experiences things the way that you're experiencing. Did you ever struggle in school? Did you ever struggle with a friend? Did you ever have to work hard? And your dad was like, keep working. You're like, but I'm tired. And he was like, sorry, bud, life's not fair. And I got to believe Joseph was a good dad and told his kid that. But all the while, discovering within himself, I am God in the flesh. And recognizing, like, there are things I could do and think that, wow, I could just make this all go away, but this is the thing that Jesus did that blows my mind. He, like, turned that off all the time in Scripture. There's this great scene we looked at several weeks ago of him being tempted by the devil, and he's super hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days, and the devil's like, couldn't you just turn these rocks into bread and then not be hungry anymore? And Jesus is like, that's not what I'm here for. I'm not here to be happy, to serve myself, to gratify my flesh. I'm here to pioneer the path to show people that sometimes life is not easy, but they can still find joy. So God put on skin, and he came to live on this earth. And he went through it all so that we could have a chance to be made right with God. And it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was that joy? What was he seeing in the distance? It was you. It was me. That's what he saw over the horizon. I can make it through this because I'm doing it for them. Happiness is good. I think God wants us to have happiness. I think that's why he gives us the the dandelions. That's why the seeds do what they do. So you can be like, (sighs) and they blow off and you're like, that was cool. Like I think God relishes in our happiness. But he also recognizes the broken state of the world. And so he wanted to show us that there could be joy. And let me just say this. If you're in a position in your life where you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you did and it was a long time ago, and you're like, I'm not living for him anymore. If you've never submitted and say, I want to make him master of my life, this joy, like you can get tastes of the Lord's joy, but the promise of God's 
full dwelling Holy Spirit in you that can help you find joy in every circumstance, that's a promise reserved for people who say, I submit, you are master, you are king. This is for what we as Americans call the Christian. (laughs) And if you've never made that decision to make Jesus your Lord, can you give God a Christmas present this year and do that? You can do it today. There'll be a moment in a second where you can go talk to somebody and we can make that happen. We can baptize you in the parking lot. But don't stand by and just say, I can make it another day on my own. Accept that gift. And he can help you thrive in it. There's so much more I can say about joy. Um, But I want to close kind of with two things. The first one is this. I I want to quote a a psalm uh, from Psalm chapter 95 that just talks about joy. Because as the ancient Hebrews were working through figuring out joy, uh, King David and others wrote songs about it. (laughs) it. We all need reminders The old song says this, Psalm 95, verse 1, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is great. The Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him, and the sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed dry land. So come, let us worship and bow down and let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. I, I, I knew the scripture and I wanted to read it. And then I didn't even realize until I was reading it again this week that at the end he talks about these shepherds and these sheep. And he's the great shepherd. And how cool is it that he's like, look, I get it. You guys are like sheep. <laughs> Just like the shepherds I showed up to. You need a shepherd. Jesus, of course, is called the good shepherd in John chapter 10. And so what does it mean for us to find joy? Well, the psalmist says you need to sing to God. (laughs) Not everyone is, uh, you know, Taylor Swift and putting out hits every day. And Jesus wants to sing all the time. But I think innately we have this ability to praise with song or at least the thoughts of song. And so here's here's our challenge this week. It's simple. You might think it's stupid the first time you hear it, but I'm going to promise you this because I've been doing it for about two days. Uh, If you do it all week, you're going to find out that like, man, this actually might work. Okay, here, let me just read it to you. This week, each time your happiness slips away because it's slippery, choose joy instead. But how do I choose joy? Oh, here's a great idea. By simply reciting the words to the song, joy to the world. Maybe you know another song. Read that one. Read Psalm 95. That's a good one. But someone cuts you off in traffic, and you're like, oh, you joy to the world, the Lord. Is. And then you got to be like, okay, why am I doing this? Oh, yeah. And you are at Target. I went to Target yesterday. It was a bad idea. And the line's so long, and you do, you know, and then you're like, joy to the world, and heaven and heaven. Sing it out loud. People will think you're crazy, <laughs> but God will love it, and it will start to shift your heart. And remember, the joy comes from honoring God and putting other people first. Even when I'm inconvenienced, even when I'm in pain, even when things aren't the way that I want them to be, even when I got to tell you in about seven to eight to ten days, you're going to be with relatives that you hate being with. They'll be like, why do you keep singing joy to the world? It's a good song. It's my favorite. And he will bring you joy. Let's pray.